Hallelujah. Day in sin of day, as old as you are, as old as you are, you will never change. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't know if y'all had one more song. That was it? Okay, praise the Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. God is good. All righty, why don't we just go ahead and be seated, everybody. Let's, let's, um, let us all be seated. Come on, somebody. Praise, praise, praise God. Praise God. Praise, praise the Lord. Ah, come on. I think we need to um, kick off. Tonight, with a little bit of reading. Oh yes, let's do a little bit of reading. So if you would come with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7, and we are going to read 4 through 7. The gospel according to our brother Matthew. Verse 4. Chapter 7, verse 4. And we'll try to stop reading before we get to verse 14. Because we don't want Patricia to have any bones to pick with us. Matthew chapter 7, verse 4. The Bible says, Or how can you say to your brother, Let me remove the speck from your eye. And look, a plank is in your own eye. <laughs> Woo, praise the Lord. This was the Lord Jesus. So if you have a Bible that was not made in some basement, it should have this written in red. Okay? And it says, once again, um, in fact, let me read verse 3. Just for Manuelita's sake. The Bible says, Jesus speaking, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eyes? You see, because if you look, you will always find something. So Jesus is saying, why, what are you looking for? Why do you look? So now let's continue reading verse 5. Verse 4 again, or, 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 how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eyes. 
Now, let me explain something, you know, because I know there are people here or watching online who may have studied the writings of the Apostle Paul, and you've read you know, later on in the New Testament wherein it says that there is no temptation that is upon one that is not common to all. So you may say, well, if what things will go through are universal, then if I have a plank in my own eyes, then that means Sister Z's got a plank in her eye too. You understand what I'm saying? Because you know how people want to justify certain things. Like, okay, when Jesus says, and, and, and if I may shock you, you are somewhat correct. You are. You see, what Jesus was trying to establish here isn't particularly that what is wrong with somebody else is less than what is wrong with you. You see, because you may say, okay, well, Jesus is trying to say that uh, for every speck that is in someone's eye, there is a plank in mine. But the understanding that I have when you compare spiritual with spiritual is that God is saying that if you keep finding fault in other people, I can find greater fault in you. You see, because at the end of the day, you need to understand the way God operates. Remember the servant who was forgiven a thousand denarii, but then he went to strangle the one that held him ten, or maybe one. What did he say? He said, you need to pay me. And he only embarrassed him. But when the king or the master the overall boss found what he had done. What did he say? He says, now, you may have caused a little scene around the guy's house. You may have embarrassed him amongst his family. He says, but for you, I will have you thrown into the dungeon to see the light of day no more. So when you look at that, and you apply the consistency with which God deals with people, then you want to be extra careful with what measure you measure to other people. Because Jesus says, with the same measure that you measured, it will be measured back unto you, but he didn't stop there. He says, good measure. Pressed down shaking together and running over. God says, I have designed this system or this existence to run by the principle of multiplication so that whatever you dish out is what you get multiplied. So if I know how to send blessings to Mary Ann's house, I will get blessings in return. But from God's perspective, what I have done, even though it might be little, from God's perspective, it's a huge thing, and he will pay me back from his own standpoint. That's why the Bible says, whosoever gives to the poor lends unto God, and he will repay. You see, I may have given to the poor a cup of cold water, the ones who gave a cup of cold water, what was their reward? Eternal life. <laughs> Think about it. You give a cup of cold water and Jesus was like, you get the holy commendation. And whoever gets that commendation can never be condemned. So Jesus says, come into the rest of your master. Because that rest is an eternal rest. You see, so... We need to understand what's going on in here. When Jesus says, oh, if you see a plank, a, a speck in your brother's eyes, Jesus is saying, well, look, what I am seeing from my position is actually a plank in your own eyes. Everything is bigger in God's eyes. That little gossip is bigger in God's eyes. You know, sometimes, you know, you find people just not wishing other people well. 
And, and that's because you just don't think they deserve any better. And so you think to yourself that, I mean, I'm, I don't know. I don't agree with that person just getting away with stuff and getting blessed. You see, in God's eyes, that is like murder. Because if the power were given to you in the full measure of your composition, you know we're made in the image and in the likeness of God. And so God is like, if I let this one realize the extent of what I have put in them with that kind of mindset, they will erase everybody before I'm even able to judge anybody. Oh yeah, that was what the disciples wanted to do. Remember, they were like, man, if you give us the permission, we will call down fire. We can even ask a white beast to come and consume these little people. And what did Jesus tell them? He says, if you know who you are, because it's because we don't know. Because the moment we know, then we don't do things casually. You know what Jesus said? Jesus says, according to your constitution, according to your law, whosoever insults his brother without a cause will have to stand before the magistrate. Jesus says, if you just go on insulting people, insulting their dignity, you will go to court. He said, but I have come to say to you that whosoever says to his brother, thou art a fool. Jesus says, not only will you stand in judgment, you stand the danger of hell. Everything is magnified in God's eyes. And he says, just so that you know heaven's standard, every idle word that men speak. What is an idle word? A word that is non-productive. Because when you have idle people, what do they do? They don't produce. They sit down all day, watch TV. They keep scrolling on social media. They're not executing any plan to improve themselves or anyone else. Those are idle people. So the opposite of idle is productive. And so when, whatever it is that you say that does not produce glory in the life of another, the Bible says you will give an account of it. So every one of those times you have asked somebody, who do you think you are? You know, when you ask people that question, it's not to empower them, it's to reduce them. You don't go to people saying, well, happy birthday. So who do you think you are? No. You can say, oh, how, how old are you? You're making an inquiry. But who do you think you are uh, is an example of what we say to people that does not produce. It is an idle word. Because it is meant to reduce another person. It's meant to take away from another person. It's meant to impede another person. And I know that sometimes we feel justified because we feel like, oh, this person is being boastful. I need to humble them. Okay. If you go about humbling people, remember, everything is bigger in God's eyes. So when you think you're humbling them, as far as God is concerned, you're actually trampling over them. And when yours comes, it's going to be what? Good measure. Press down. Verse 5 says, hypocrite. First, remove the plank from your own eye. And then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eyes. Now, verse 6, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine. Why shouldn't I give something holy to the dogs? One of the very fundamental things that we know about dogs is that they do not have hands like you and I. You understand what I mean? So whatever you give a dog to handle, you must be prepared to forfeit. Because they do not have the ability of care. They sink their teeth into everything. And so when the Bible says... Do not give what is holy to the dogs. <laughs> the father is saying, do not submit yourself 
to the judgment and mercy of other people. Because if you go around finding fault in them, you are automatically opening the door for them to sink their teeth into you and they'll be very justified because you started it. When you pull a dog's tail, what does it do? It turns around to bite you. And God is like some of these people who have speck in their eyes. I allowed you to see the speck so you can keep moving. I didn't allow for you to see the speck so that you can call it out and be judging them by it because they are dogs and they will come for you. You know, we can correct people who, in, you see, you, you, don't, you don't just hand correction out. You know, we've done that. Where we're just so, the zeal of the Lord's house. David says, the zeal of the Lord's house has consumed me and then made me a reproach unto my mother's children. He said, the zeal of your house consumed me and now I am a reproach to my mother's children, simply because I was just so zealous, I did not apply sense. Zeal without discretion makes you a trained dog, but you're still a dog. Because you also go about biting people in the name of correcting them. Paul says, be careful not to bite one another. He said, because if you keep biting one another, you shall be consumed of one another. Because if we, all we do all day is not develop the ability to handle things with care, we will end up consuming one another. And so because if you're reading sometimes, you wonder why, how did Jesus come get from speck in the eyes to dogs? Could he not just have drawn the line and say, okay, now, next chapter? He was literally in the same breath as he was saying it. And what he was telling them was this. He says, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Like I said, we used to just hand out correction. But there are seven times wherein you don't hand out correction until you have made sure that there is room for acceptance. You understand what I'm saying? Because we are so zealous. We want to correct that other person. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says that as a crown is fitting for the head of a king... So are mighty blows for the mouth of a fool. And let's chew on that for a moment. The Bible says God recommends that a king should have a crown. That's why the Bible says that Jesus has crowns upon crowns. Jesus' crowns are crowns upon crowns upon crowns upon crowns simply because he's the head of all principalities and power. So he has a crown for every domain. That's what it means, because you can't be the king of kings if you don't have the crown for that particular domain. And so when you see him, as far as your eyes can see, if you can see, the crowns continue to infinity. And that is the reason why no one can sit above him. You see, we know that a crown is fitting for the head of a fool. And the Bible says, just as that is fitting, so are not just soft blows, but mighty blows for the mouth of a fool. Because there are certain prescriptions that come from God that we think we can do better than. You know, when God is telling us, this is how I want you to do things, you're like, oh God, I'm nicer than you. And you know, whenever you try to tell God that you are a nicer person than him, he tells you to knock yourself out. Because he will still be God when you learn and come back. To say, wow. You could have told me, and he said, uh, I did. In fact, I even wrote it down. You understand what I mean? And so we need to be, we need to apply discretion together with discernment. And the reason why these things are important is because a lot of us, our journey and relationship with our Heavenly Father is impeded 
by our relationship with other people. Remember on Saturday we were talking about being able to approach God as a heavenly father. And how many people struggle with approaching God as a heavenly father because the earthly fathers they know have done nothing but let them down again and again. And so they project the image of the failures that they have seen to that of the heavenly father. So they would rather come to God as a boss. You know when you go to a boss, you just want to do your work, get their approval, you want to impress them. You want to make sure that you're in their good books. And so everything is based on your works. But with your heavenly father, everything should be based on his love. Because adequate understanding of the love of God and acceptance thereof is what actually motivates good works. God is not expecting works from us. He's only expecting good works. And your works can only be good if they are inspired in his love. Does it make sense? And so, I, I, I don't need to go to him as a, as a boss. But some of us, that's what we do. Why? Because of the failure that we have experienced in our relationship with human beings. Now, the Bible says, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see God. What is holiness? You know, because quite often, we think that holiness is sinlessness. We think that holiness is sanctification. Sanctification is different from holiness. You wouldn't see in the Bible where anybody said, Oh, sanctified, sanctified, thou art sanctified. But you will see holy, holy, holy. Holiness refers to the perfection of character. When we say God is the most holy, it means he is one whose character has no blemish. You see, because when the Bible says follow peace with all men and holiness, we should have known that was our clue to know that being at peace has got something to do with his holiness because they said and. And so being at peace with all men needs to be coupled with having a godly character. And to have a godly character means to do things like God does things. To have God's reaction to things. You know, when you think about God's character, you think about what is a person's character. A person's character is usually a reflection of their disposition to life and to things. And so when you say someone is a man of integrity, integrity is an attribute of character, which means regardless of the cost of telling the truth, they will. Even if you would take their head and place it on a platter and cut it off, they will not tell a fib. They would always tell the truth because that is their character. Their character includes maintaining integrity. And so when you look at character from the perspective or from the definition or through that lens of disposition or expression of a person's disposition, then you can begin to follow in the footsteps of your heavenly father because all through human history, God has appeared and shown himself as a participant or has presented himself as an actor in different scenarios so that we can see how we should behave when it is our turn. So one of the ones that we elaborated on on Saturday was how does God relate to people who treat him badly? When Jesus was treated badly, what did he do? He said to the father, he says, father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Because he knows the father that that's what the father does. And so we were supposed to take note of that so that when people wrong us, we don't immediately jump to judgment. You see, God saved the judgment of the saints of the world. He saved it for the end of the world. So that as long as there is time, what we see is mercy. The Bible says as long as the sun rises and sets, which is the old King James I mean, expression of as long as there is time. Whenever you see as long as the sun rises and sets, it means as long as there is time, there is what? 
mercy. The Bible says the mercy of God is renewed every morning. So that means God expects us to be continually merciful. From your standpoint, it's called what? Long-suffering. It's a fruit of the Spirit, right? It's called long-suffering. Yeah, when we were little, our pastor would say to us, if you want to understand what long-suffering means, it means you sign up to suffer for long. And when he said that, I didn't, I wasn't sure if I wanted that fruit of the Spirit. Can we skip to the next one, please? You know? Yeah, you can skip every fruit of the Spirit and go to the last one. Because the moment you get to the last fruit of the Spirit, and you can champion that one, then you have every other thing. Because God knows us. He knows we like to pick and choose. And so you're like, hey, this love, long suffering. I don't know. This patience. Have you, have you seen Josephine? I don't know. You know, you keep saying all of these things. And then when you get to self-control, then what does that tell you? You see, we're talking about the the character of God. I mean, you think God doesn't have self-control? God is self-control personified. Because the Bible says that if the Lord should regard iniquity, none shall stand. You know, the Bible says, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Iniquity or sin is to disobey the order of God. And the cells in your body, they breathe. Everything that has breath. So if the Lord should regard iniquity, how many of us can stand? Because we cannot all say that the cells in our bodies are all functioning right. Some of us, our organs, even have a mind of their own sometimes. You understand what I mean? By the time you turn 40, your back becomes almost a different person to you. Because when I was younger, anytime I wanted to get up, my back was with me. We were in one accord. But then after a while, I noticed that I want to get up and my back is like, who do you think you are? <laughs> yeah, who do you think you are? And sometimes when my back is nice, it will ask me, how old are you? And so I can resume my place. You understand what I mean? And so the Bible says to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see God. And so we know that it is very critical for us to understand human interaction. To be able to deal with people. You understand what I mean? Because whether you like it or not, God loves people. You know, I almost want to say God is madly in love with people. So that person that you don't like, God loves him. I know, it's almost annoying sometimes. Because I'm like, God, can't you just see what I'm seeing? And God is like, no, can't you see what I am seeing? And that is the reason why you cannot rubbish the weirdest people. Now, I need to balance this out because you know that I was telling you that the Bible says that the blow, mighty blows are fitting for the mouth of a fool. You understand what I mean? But then the Bible also says, do not answer a fool according to his folly. But then, answer a fool according to his folly. Have you come across that in your Bible? The Bible says, don't answer a fool according to his folly. But then the Bible also says, answer a fool according to his folly. So that he doesn't begin to feel wise in his own eyes. So which one is the first one? The first one is don't answer a fool according to his folly so that you do not become like him. But once you are confident in your identity and you know where you stand, then you can answer so that you can then make it clear the difference between wisdom and foolishness. And then let them choose if they want to remain on the other side or if they want to repent, humble themselves and come to where you're at. Does it make sense? So don't immediately answer them until you yourself are confident of your position as a godly person, which means a person that is exhibiting a holy character. Jesus said here, he says, do not cast, do not give what is holy to the dogs. And um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's something that I want to bring out. I know that I already explained it, but I just want you to see where it is in scripture. Your character your attitude needs to be holy, like God's 
attitude is holding. And so don't let yourself be in a situation wherein that response that is supposed to be holy, that is supposed to reflect God's disposition, now be taken by somebody who does not know how to handle with care and they sink their teeth into it. Let me give you an example of how that happens. Every single one of us have the divine ability by God to get angry. But do you know that you can be, you, there's a holy anger. God's anger is a very holy one because the Bible says God's anger is but for a moment. So God says be angry, but don't sin. He says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Right? So it can be a holy thing. Because when you have something that exists, the way God prescribes it, the way God performs it, without sin, it is holy. And so it is possible for you to cast your anger at a dog. And the dog is like, I've been waiting for this. Two can play the game and it becomes dirty dancing. You get messed up even though what you brought out was a holy anger. So you need to know how to be angry without giving that other person an opportunity to then take your expression of anger as a registration certificate to say that you are now playing in their arena. Because some people, the moment you bring out your, the anger, they're like, oh, you think you can do that? Who do you think you are? And then both of you will go at it. So there is a way you can be angry, but don't let it get in the mouth of the dog. How do you do that? Don't give somebody an opportunity to abuse your holiness. You see, because we at times are the ones that put our affairs in the mouth of dogs. Because some people, because they're dogs, they don't know how to handle what you're saying. They just want to sink their teeth into it. Don't give them a thing to say. They already know that they are wrong as wrong itself. But they're waiting for just that one thing that you will say. And then they become vindicated. They're like, they will say things like, oh, I was willing to take everything until you said that. And it's like, oh, shoot. But when I said that, I didn't say that to put you down. I said that to express my anger because it's okay for me to be angry. But the Bible says it is holy. It needs to remain holy. You cannot let it get into the mouth of the dog. That is one thing. But some people are not dogs. Some people are pigs. And the Bible says, don't cast your pearl before swine. Why is that? You need to observe what people do with what you have given. The last time I gave you an advice, what did you do with it? The last time I gave you a compliment, what did you do with it? The last time I shared my heart with you, what did you do with it? If you keep taking precious things into the mud, then the next time you come, you ain't getting no pearls from me. Because pearls are precious. They are born out of my pain, out of my experiences, out of the dealings of heaven with me. I'm not just going to be casting my pearls at you every time. You did nothing with the last one but bury it in the mud. You want to play dirty with holy things? Then I'm not playing with you. Because some people are not dogs. See, sometimes the dogs are better. Because they will sink their teeth into it and then you know, okay, I'm not going to put my shoe here again. Because this dog is going to get it. You know, well, pigs are worse. Because even if you keep your things in a secluded place, as long as you let them in, they can bring mud with them into a place that is holy. Let me explain that in another way. There are certain people that can make a mess of a sane situation. They, they, they're just, I almost want to say they're gifted at it. But they're just really dirty like that. So as long as you let them, 
You just have to let them in and they will bring their mud with them. And that's the reason why the Bible says, do not cast your pearl before them. Why? Because the moment they see that you have pearl and that you don't have discretion, they will keep coming for you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You see, and why are these things important? Because our Heavenly Father wants us to be holy as He is holy. The Bible says no man in his dealings with God can find fault with the Most High. In the wisdom of Elihud, he said, who amongst you has ever corrected God? Who amongst you? He was talking to, his, to Job's friends. In fact, I think it's a very good opportunity today to, let's talk about Job's friends for a minute. Come with me to the book of Job chapter 3. Because I promised that a while ago, but I don't think I ever went deep into it. Let's talk about the friends of Job today. Because they give you an example of people. Now let's read Job chapter 2 verse 11. The Bible says, now when Job's three friends. Do you know why Job had three friends? <laughs> I'll give you three reasons. There are four directions that you can go in life. It's either you go to the north, to the east, to the west, or to the south. If you don't go to God, you will go in one of the other three directions. And Satan knows that, so he has friends positioned at the three coordinates. People whose ideas are always opposite to that of God. Some of them, like the east and the west, they're the trickiest ones because they seem to be at right angles with the north. But they will still take you to places unknown. Three friends. Another reason why Job had to have three friends is because from God's perspective, there are typically three types of righteous men. And so you had to have three types of unrighteous men. Who are the three types of righteous men? Charles, give me one of them. Aha, you're going to do like 50 push-ups after service today. You know when the Bible was talking about the righteousness that men can exhibit on their own, apart from the righteousness of the one who came from the north, the righteousness of Christ. We have the righteousness of Noah. We have the righteousness of who? Noah, the righteousness of Job, and the righteousness of Daniel. So the, you have the righteousness of the one who never gives up on God, the righteousness of the one who rests confident in God at all times, and the righteousness of one who would not accept any other verdict except God's verdict. Job means hated. He was hated, but he didn't curse God. Noah means rest. He was troubled, but he didn't drown in the cares, in the flood. And then you have Daniel, who says, the Lord is my judge. It doesn't matter what the doctors say. The Lord's verdict is all that I care about. It doesn't matter what my bank account is saying, but the Lord says that I will not borrow, but I will lend on to nations. And so you see those three men, right? You will find the, uh, the other side of that in these other guys. And it's good to be familiar with the friends of Job because these are the same friends that we have. You know why? Because you are Job. Not everyone is saying amen. <laughs> Woo, shaka boomba. <clears throat> oh, shaka, shaka boomba. You see, Jesus said, you are Job. He says, as they have hated me, they will hate you. And he told his disciples, he says, and I say that with a guarantee. He says, it's guaranteed. He says, what they have done to me, they will do to you. And when the apostles came, they actually saw that it was a privilege to be hated by the world because they understood that to be friends with God, you have to be. Come on. The Bible says friendship with the world is enmity against God. So have I not been teaching you to read from right to left and left to right, which means friendship with God is enmity against the world. And so the fact that they hate you, is a privilege. 
It allows for there to be always a clear distinction between you and them. Because woe are you if they embrace you into their company. Why? Because the Bible says the companionship of fools shall be destroyed. So I'm happy they have not welcomed me into their company so that when their destruction comes, only with my eyes will I behold the reward of the wicked. It's not a bad thing after all to be hated by the world. If anything, I thought you should strive for it. Not my recommendations, the word. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now let us keep reading. And um, Job chapter 2 verse 11. I'm going to read it here and here. In case you didn't, you missed the memo. Job means to be hated. In case you're wondering, well, where is this man coming from? I'm not coming from, um, but anyway, that's what it means. Praise the Lord. Where's my Job? Um, yeah, my Bible has, this Bible has about a third, if not a quarter of its volume as study materials. And so sometimes when you think you're opening the middle of the Bible, you're really still in Esther. I know. Okay, so Job. Job is an interesting book. Yeah, you, uh, I used to read it a lot. Okay, so where is, where are we? 2.11. The Bible says, now when Job's three friends heard of all of his adversity. <laughs> you know, we can keep talking about all these things. It's like, this is like a gift that keeps giving. There are some people that will never hear when God is doing good things in your midst. Some people will never come to see you and say, I heard somebody got healed at one of your meetings. No, they would only slide into your DM to say, oh my, I'm really sorry. There's this thing going on, going on that I just heard. How come you only hear of adversity? Anybody who comes and they only hear bad things about you, they are from the West, from the East, from the South, but they are not from the Northern city of the great King. Do not give them a time of your day. You see, these boys did not come when Job was said to be the wealthiest man in the East. Where were they when God was boasting of his confidence in Job? Let me explain that. You see, because when the Holy Spirit dropped that in my spirit, whoa, I loved it. God was confident. God was expressing what? His confidence in Job. John, let me use you as an example. You see? No, the same John. Let me use you as an example. No, no, stand up. That's what I mean. Oh, yeah, yeah. Please come and stay here. All righty. So, in fact, I think anybody past that thing will not be seen. So come right here where you can be seen. God is good. So you can stay right there. So, I want you to do something. I want you to. Don't worry. It's got sweat on it, but it's okay. Yeah, I, I had to give the disclaimer. So, this thing... Is my handkerchief. Put it in your pocket. Has it become his? Uh, no, no, because I didn't give him. I just said put it in your pocket. I didn't say happy birthday. That's your Christmas present or birthday present. So that is my face towel in his, in his pocket. So God was boasting of his confidence in Job. It wasn't that God was confident in Job, but God knew that Job had, Job had confidence and that confidence that he had was God's confidence. And so God was boasting of his confidence that was in Job. I can boast of my handkerchief that is in his pocket, but it is still mine. But he becomes a custodian of it. Job was holding something in his heart, and that was the God kind of confidence. And because God kind of confidence never fails, God knew that Job wasn't going to fail. Praise the Lord. Thank you. There is hand sanitizer in the back. God bless you. That is the reason why when Jesus told Peter, thank you, man or leader. I just need a few more man or leaders in my life. And I'll be walking on water. Even before I know it. 
She'll be the one telling me, Pastor, did you know you crossed here on water? Yeah, praise God. Jesus, oh, come on. Anyway, let's, 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 uh, let's, let's come back here. Peter, <laughs> he said, Lord, increase our faith. Let me tell you something. Everything that you need to make it in life cannot be your own. It has to be God's. So the love with which you love your spouse, your friends, and your children cannot be one that is concorded in this earthen vessel. It has to be one that is gifted to these earthen vessels. Because if it, is, if it originates from here, it has an expiration. So it has to originate from there. The vision that I have for the assignment that God has, to, has given to me has to be God's vision. It has to be how God sees. Praise the Lord. So Job chapter 2 verse 11. The Bible says now Job's three friends heard that all heard of all of his adversity. When God was boasting they didn't hear that. They only heard of the adversity. Why? Have you ever wondered why? You see because the Bible says seek. Let me, let me do you a favor. See that Matthew 7 that we read. What did I tell you? I said we're going to read 4 through to 7. Many of us, myself inclusive, we have always quoted 7. <laughs> let me read it. For what translation of the Bible do you have? Okay, it's the same thing as this one. So, let's read it very quickly from here. When you read Matthew chapter 7, verse 4 through 7, we stopped at 6, didn't we? Where Jesus was talking about not casting your pearl before swine. Then what did he say after that? He said, because they will turn and tear you in pieces. What was the next thing he said? Verse 7. He says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. Verse 8 says, because whosoever asks receives. So Jesus was letting us know that a lot of what you have received from people is what you asked for. If you have received Disrespect, you asked for it. Now, let me say this. You see, Jesus was not preaching episodes or series. He was talking still about how you interact with other people. I know it's a great scripture. I've even preached some of my most enjoyable messages from Matthew 7, 7, talking about exactly how we unravel the secrets of life and how we receive direction for, for, for progressing toward the fulfillment of destiny. But the reality of it was that when Jesus was delivering this expose, he was talking about the fact that you need to be careful what you give out to people because some of them are dogs, some of them are swine, but in all, just know that whatsoever you receive is what you ask for. Whatever you find in people is what you're seeking. If I keep finding fault in people, then that means I was seeking fault in people. I cannot find what I am not seeking. I cannot have the door of disrespect open to me if I haven't knocked on the door of disrespect. Because the Bible says it is to him who knocks that the door is open. The Bible says ask and you shall receive for whatsoever. Everyone who receives asks for something. Everyone who finds Verse 8 says they must have been seeking for something. And so, you see, the way Jesus presented it is such that we will understand people from, we will better understand people right from the time we meet them. It may not be day one, but you would know them before they have an opportunity 
to ruin you. And so if somebody keeps coming to me and all they always find is fault, then I went, okay, that's a fault seeker right there. Because a fault seeker is a fault finder. <laughs> you see, there are certain times wherein some people bring abuse, even though you haven't asked for it. It is called an attack. That happens. But there is also a guarantee that if you ask for abuse, you will get it. In God's faithfulness. Because God is fair like that. Whosoever asks, receives. And so look at these boys. Let's go back to the friends of Job. And then you will see something about these, these guys. These interesting fellows. Verse 11. The Bible says, well, now when Job's three friends heard of all, his, of all this adversity that, they had, that had come upon him, each one of them came from his own place. Anybody who only hears bad things about you is not one who thinks good things concerning you. And some people don't know. They just do, they're just ignorant like that. And so sometimes you have to give a mighty blow to the mouth of a fool and say to them, well, Anthony, how come... You only hear bad things about us. <laughs> I'm just wondering. <laughs> you see, you need to put some people in their place. Because that, would, that should make him go home and think to himself. Forget what they say. When you challenge people like that, you know what they always say. Or they're like, well, it's not my fault. Bad news travels fast. Oh yeah, bad news travels fast to people going nowhere. Oh yeah, that's what happens. Do you know the people who receive the most bad news in the world? They're the people who go nowhere in the evenings. They don't go to fellowship. They don't go to visit other people. They don't go to be a blessing. They just be sitting out home watching TV. They get all the bad news because bad news travels fast to people going nowhere. But if you are busy seeking how to improve the quality of another person's life, people will be asking you two, three days later, oh, did you hear this thing happen? I'm like, I didn't. I am too busy. Going about like Jesus doing good. <laughs> you see, if you, have, if you have no way you're going, when, when Lazarus was sick, Jesus was two days journeying away from bad news. Two days journeying away. But of course, some people, they take it upon themselves to find you with bad news. And Jesus neutralized the bad news. Because... Before they got to where they were going, the men had died. And, you know, Jesus gave us another example of what you do, even if you have to break news that is not so pleasant. Jesus said to his disciples, oh, Lazarus is asleep. Whereas he died. If it was some of us, we will exaggerate what happened. We will say things that, like, you know, the last time we were with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, all three of them ate from the same bowl. I wonder if whatever killed Lazarus by now hasn't killed Mary and Martha. And everyone is going to be like, oh my word. And then the person, you know, you said perhaps. And then the Thomas that hears you will go and tell somebody, do you know that everyone in Bethsaida is dead now? Because they all went to Lazarus' house and he got the virus and everybody got it and they're all dead. In fact, when was the last time you went to Bethsaida? In the last one week, oh, you need to get yourself checked. You need to be quarantined. 